In this lecture, we will cover the structure and replication of viruses. When we cover pathogens later in the semester, we will describe viruses that infect humans and their impacts, including SARS-CoV-2. Viruses are non-living molecular machines that take over their host cells and trick them into making copies of the virus. Here are the learning outcomes. I will define viruses as highly specific obligate intracellular parasites that affect members of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Viruses are an unknown, ominous frontier. There are many things we don't know about them. Viruses are everywhere that bacteria are, in densities of 10 million per cubic centimeter. They impact microbial food webs and biogeochemical cycles. They are the causative agents of many human diseases, including cancers, but may also provide treatment to control unwanted bacterial growth, especially in superbugs. Here are some fun facts. There are tenfold more viruses on Earth than living cells. Most genetic diversity on Earth is in viral genomes. Most of the nucleic acid on Earth is in viral genomes. Finally, 75% of the viral metagenome, meaning all the viral DNA that we know about, does not match any known cellular genes. We don't understand what these proteins are doing. So clearly we still need to learn a lot about viruses. How big are viruses? Most viruses are about 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers. The smallest bacterium is about 300 nanometers and a little bit larger than a ribosome. The largest virus, the Pandora virus, was discovered three years ago and is about one micron. Of course, the Pandora virus is infecting a eukaryotic cell. Viruses are important to humans because they cause important diseases. Obviously, considering the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, the virus that causes COVID-19, I don't need to convince you that learning about viruses is worthwhile. But viruses also cause a number of important different diseases in humans as listed in this table. The virion is the complete infectious extracellular viral particle. Viruses will have various parts. At the center of the virus is the genome that encodes the genetic instructions for making new virus. This nucleic acid can be DNA or RNA, single or double-stranded, and that's very different than the host cells that you're used to thinking about, where the genome is double-stranded DNA. Surrounding the nucleic acid can be a capsid that is a self-assembling protein shell, usually made of one or a few types of monomers. Using just one monomer saves DNA because as little as one gene can assemble into a capsid. Some viruses are surrounded by an envelope that is a protein-containing membrane that goes around the virus. Viral morphologies can be symmetrical or complex. There are rod-shaped viruses, such as the tobacco mosaic virus, icosahedral viruses, meaning they're 20-sided, such as the cold virus, and envelope viruses, such as SARS-CoV-2 and the influenza virus. Virus shapes can be complex. T4 is an example of a complex virus that infects the bacterium E. coli. Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophage or phage. Most that we have studied so far are naked viruses, meaning they have no envelope, with double-stranded DNA genomes. But examples of all four possibilities, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded DNA, and double-stranded DNA have been found. Many bacteriophage are structurally complex. Many animal viruses have an envelope. Whole virions enter the host cell, and when the virus leaves, it drapes itself in the host membrane, which is kind of creepy. 
However, viral proteins are embedded in the membrane that allow host attachment are involved in the viral release. Many plant viruses are single-stranded RNA. Double-stranded genomes are rare. However, as with bacteriophage, all four types of genomes are represented in eukaryotic viruses. Let's test your comprehension so far. A newly isolated virus has been analyzed for its chemical structure and it has been found to contain DNA, protein, and lipids. What type of virus is it? Second one, the shape, the shape, uh, the shape shown above is the tomaco mosaic virus. What shape is it? Okay, going back, this must be an envelope virus because it has a lipid membrane. It has lipids in it, and those are only found in membranes. We don't know if it's a hycosahedral virus, so all you can say is it's an envelope virus. D is the correct answer. The tobacco mosaic virus is a rod-shaped virus. Even though viruses vary considerably, their overall replication patterns are the same. The life cycle of the typical bacteriophage is 20 to 60 minutes. For animal viruses, it takes longer, 8 to 40 hours. There are six steps to viral replication. Attachment, penetration, synthesis, assembly, release, and maturation. Let's go through each of them. Each replication cycle can produce a few to a few thousand virions. Attachment is specific to receptors on the host. It is a key fitting into a lock. Bacteriophage will target O antigens, dichoic acids, flagella, pili, or transport proteins. In animal cells, surface macromolecules used in cell-to-cell -cell communication or the immune system often serve as receptors. Each virus will have a unique receptor that it recognizes. Attachment in human cells is tissue specific. Receptors are always on the cell surface and are essential for cellular function, so they're not easily mutated. The constancy of the receptor is important because it will be hard for the cell to close that door to the virus if it needs it for other reasons. The receptor that a virus binds to dictates what cells a virus can infect. This is why rhinoviruses, the cause of the common cold, only infect the nose. It attaches to the ICAM receptor present on your nasal passages. Plant viruses spread most often by insect vectors and are injected into this plant or enter via cell damage. Once inside, they can spread from cell to cell using microscopic channels present in between plant cells. Once attached to a cell, a virus then needs to penetrate the cytoplasm. In animal cells, this can follow the endocytotic pathway where the virus migrates to a clathrin coated pit after being bound by a receptor. The cell then envelops the virus in an endosome. The endosome's acidification often causes a change in outer viral proteins that cause a fusion with the membrane. This fusion results in the release of viral nucleic acid into the cytoplasm. Other viruses will fuse directly with the host cell membrane after binding their receptor, bypassing the endosome. Bacteriophage have to contend with the cell wall of the bacterium. Because of this, they will have enzymes and protein functions that inject the genome into the cell. For example, bacteriophage T4 has a tail tube with lysozyme activity at its end. This tail tube behaves like a syringe. The lysozyme degrades the peptidoglycan, and once it punches a hole in the peptidoglycan, the phage injects its genome into the cell cytoplasm. Synthesis. Once inside the virus, will begin expressing the genes encoded in its nucleic acid. For simple viruses, this may be synthesized all at once. In larger viruses, expression may be broken into early, middle, and late phases. Early ones are involved in the takeover of the host. Sometimes it is dramatic, like the rearrangement of organelles to facilitate virus production. For example, the vesicles shown in the picture at right 
derived from the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is occurring in a human infected with SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. This actually creates a replication apparatus that the virus then uses. Late proteins are involved in assembly of viral particles and escape from the cell. Assembly. Once the cell synthesizes viral proteins, they will assemble. Sometimes this assembly is spontaneous. At other times, it is driven by other viral proteins that are made. The steps of assembly are sequential. At the right is shown the assembly of phage T4, a complex virus. Each step occurs before the next can begin, eventually resulting in a fully functional virus. This assembly often involves host encoded proteins in addition to virally encoded proteins. These assistant proteins support or catalyze the assembly of the virion. Finally, the virus will release from the cell. This can occur either by lysis or by budding. Lysis may require enzymes. In phage T4 of E. coli, one enzyme, and another lysozyme, degrades the peptidoglycan of the host wall, and a second pokes holes in the plasma membrane. Envelope viruses commonly release by budding, and that is where many of them get their envelope from. All envelopes of animal viruses are derived from host membranes. Virus encoded proteins are first embedded into the membrane. Then the decorated membrane surrounds the nucleocapsid containing the genome during release. It is then buds from the cell. To review, there are six steps we have outlined to viral replication. Attachment, penetration, synthesis, assembly, release, and maturation. During replication, some viruses have two options, a lytic cycle or a lysogenic cycle. We just covered the lytic cycle, which involves replicating the virus and releasing it. In the lysogenic cycle, the virus will instead insert into the host DNA. When it does this, it now goes along for the ride, with the bacterial replication machinery making copies of it for free. These lysogens, as they are called, are resistant to superinfection because the latent phage modifies the host. For example, in P22, a bacteriophage that infects Salmonella, it modifies the O antigen so that the phage cannot recognize the cell anymore. There are advantages to being a lysogen. By inserting into the chromosome, the virus can survive host dormancy during nutrient starvation. And this happens when a cell would degrade and eat its nucleic acid, including viral genomes. Since the virus is in the host DNA, that's not going to happen. Also, when a host is in stationary phase, there is very little energy for making new viruses. Viruses are classified by how they make messenger RNA, a system first proposed by David Baltimore. In this scheme, the strands are plus and minus. The plus strand is the coding strand that encodes directions for making the proteins of the virus, and the negative strand is the template strand. This is copied to make the plus strand. Class I viruses are double-stranded DNA and use the normal transcription and replication machinery of the host. Class II viruses have a single positive DNA strand. They synthesize a complementary strand to become a double-stranded DNA and then make messenger RNA as class I does. For RNA viruses, no normal cell will make RNA from an RNA template. Therefore, the virion must supply the RNA polymerases. These replicases are typically more error-prone than DNA polymerases. Class III viruses are double-stranded RNA. Viral enzymes transcribe the negative RNA strand to make the positive strand messenger RNA copy. Class IV viruses are positive RNA and can be directly translated by the ribosome because they mimic a messenger RNA. Class 5 viruses are negative single-stranded RNA and have a unique problem. They cannot be translated by the ribosome and there is no host enzyme that will copy them to make a positive strand that could be translated. 
thus to solve this problem they have to bring along their own replicase enzyme when they infect the cell. Class 6 viruses are also strange. They are positive single-stranded RNA viruses that copy themselves into a double-stranded DNA intermediate. This is then used for transcription and translation. These are the retroviruses discovered by Temin in Baltimore. Professor Howard Temin worked at UW-Madison. To end these lectures, let's ask a couple of questions. First, below are the steps of viral infection. Place them in the correct order. Second, which type of virus must bring its own polymerase? The answer to the first question is its attachment, penetration, synthesis, assembly, and release. The virus that needs to bring its own polymerase with it when it infects a cell is negative single-stranded RNA viruses, choice C. All right, that brings us to the end of this first virology lecture.